Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is doubly fed induction generators. Our objective is to introduce doubly fed induction generators. We'll examine how a doubly fed induction generator can maintain synchronous speed while operating at different rotational speeds, manage reactive power requirements, and export real power for use. All right, kiddos, this is it. If there is any lecture worthy of running out the biggest stadium in the biggest city and projecting on the biggest movie screen accompanied by a pyrotechnic show worthy of a white snake concert, this is it. Doubly fed induction generators. D-F-I-G. D-Fig. The event of the year every aspiring technician wants to attend. If you reach this lecture with your sense of dignity still intact, you have indeed come a long, long way. In fact, since we're anticipating a sellout crowd tonight, the bouncer working the velvet ropes out front has been explicitly instructed to turn away boring and unattractive people and anyone that has yet to complete the induction generators, synchronous generators, and doubly fed induction motor lectures available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If this describes your sorry state, make haste to correct this oversight and return when you're so qualified because we are packed to capacity and the show is about to begin. In preparation for tonight's show, allow me to relate a tale of my childhood that, believe it or not, is a perfect warm-up for the main event. You kids these days live in a kinder, gentler era. Back when I grew up in the cultural dark ages of the 1980s, one of the ways 1980s parents expressed disdain for their children was to make us play ball sports, like baseball, football, golf ball, basketball, tennis ball, soccer ball, numatsli, or pelota maya, a ball game in which the winners are ritually sacrificed. Now, you might like ball sports, and that's fine, but I don't. I don't chase balls because I'm not a dog. Anyways, one summer, my parents signed me up for soccer ball camp without my consent. The summer camp was way worse than you can imagine, largely because the soccer ball coach was having an affair with the art teacher at the time. Rather than instructing us in any soccer ball skills, he just hung out with the art teacher all day and made us run laps around the athletic field. Despite directing a majority of his attention to his artistic pursuits, if you know what I mean, this guy was like a peregrine falcon when it came to detecting and exploiting any signs of weakness or exhaustion in youth. The only coaching I got that summer amounted to him yelling, Jimmy, you run like a wimp. You better pick up the pace. After a couple of days of this, I was like, I got to learn how to run. So I went to the library, which is kind of like the 1980s version of the internet, and checked out a book about running, which explained all these well-thought-out training regimes you could do to become a better runner. I read that book from cover to cover that night. And when I finished, I said, forget that. There's got to be an easier way to survive this season. So that very night, I broke into the highway department across the school, stole a bulldozer, and excavated the entire athletic field. Kind of like what Ultron did to Sokovia in Avengers Age of Ultron, if you know what I'm talking about, and I'm sure you do. Rather than smashing the field to earth like Ultron planned to do, I instead mounted the entire field on a three-phase AC motor with a variable frequency drive, set the field back in place, and returned to my bed that night and acted like nothing happened. Next day, I walked out onto the athletic field and coach is like, I want to see you wimps running around this field at four revolutions per minute. So I started walking nonchalantly around the track at 2 RPM. Coach was quick to encourage me with a well-timed shout, pick up the pace, Pytel. So rather than picking up the pace, I kept walking at 2 RPM and adjusted the variable speed potentiometer on the motor drive to start turning the entire athletic field, hurdles, high jumps, goals, end zone bases, and all at 2 RPM in the same direction I was walking. As a result, to any outside observer, it seemed like I was going 2 plus 2 or 4 RPM. Coach left me alone for the rest of the warm-up. A couple minutes later, Coach shouted, Warm-up is over, ladies. Get going. I want to see you running at 6 RPM. So I broke into this half-assed 4 RPM jog. On top of the 2 RPM motor assist, this made it seem like I was going 4 plus 2 or 6 RPM. After a couple minutes of this, I was like, this sucks, and dropped back to a 3 RPM trot. At the same time, I stepped up the rotational speed of the field to 3 RPM, all the while appearing to move at 3 plus 3 or 6 RPM to the outside. This system worked really well for a couple weeks, and just when I thought I was going to make it out of that hellhole alive, things started going wrong. First, for some reason, the system got stuck at two revolutions per minute in one direction after a heavy rain. No matter what I did, I couldn't adjust the speed anymore. This wasn't bad, though, because I always had a 2 RPM boost, and this was just enough of a boost to keep me from dying that summer. That is, until the second glitch happened on the last lap of the last day of the last week of practice. There I was trotting along with a 2 RPM boost when the coach suddenly shouted, All right, ladies, eight revolutions per minute. Conspicuous pause. 
in the opposite direction. I was like, oh, this is going to bad suck. And suck bad it did. To maintain the desired eight revolutions per minute in one direction on a circuit that was revolving two RPM in the other necessitated me running at 10 revolutions per minute, something that I hadn't done in a long, long time. After an entire summer of me dogging it, I quickly gassed out, fell to the ground to an outside observer, started going 2 RPM backwards. This is when Coach caught on to my little scheme. You'd think I would have gotten in trouble for this. You'd think you would have heard about this unbelievable story on the internet. But Coach and I came to an agreement that day whereby he didn't tell my parents and I didn't say anything about his affair with the art teacher. Until now. True story. Anyways, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, doubly fed induction generators. How in the hell does a doubly fed induction generator produce three-phase AC with fixed output frequency despite a variable speed prime mover turning the rotor at different rotational speeds? Let me show you how. Viewers are no doubt familiar with traditional synchronous generation, whereby a DC source known as an exciter establishes a fixed electromagnet on a rotor and then some external mechanical power source known as a prime mover, like moving wind, falling water, or expanding steam, turns the rotor inside a set of stator windings. The properties of the result in output voltage generated out in the stator windings of a synchronous generators are related to the inputs in the following manner. The physical construction of the stator windings influences phase shift. The rotational direction of the prime mover influences phase sequence. Field current magnitude influences voltage magnitude. And finally, prime mover rotational speed influences both frequency and voltage magnitude. Additionally, we learn once synchronized to a larger grid, a synchronous generator can manage real power export by increasing torque and reactive power needs by adjusting field current. Synchronous generators are the workhorses of modern society and generate a vast proportion of electrical power. This being said, they're known to be large, expensive, and somewhat complicated. Additionally, since rotational speed directly influences output voltage and frequency, they're not exactly the best choice for variable speed applications. Wind power, I'm looking at you. Sure, if you are a hydropower facility with 537,000 acre feet of water stacked up behind a dam or a nuclear power plant with a lifetime of fuel at your disposal, it's super easy to divert a controllable amount of water or steam into a turbine such that it maintains rotational speed and thus frequency inside a very tight predictable range. Wind, not so much. Wind blows when it wants to as fast or as slow as it wants to go in whatever direction it's blowing from only to switch directions, speed up, or stop altogether the next second. Long story short, a wind-driven synchronous generator would be a dumb idea. Not to say that it hasn't been tried. One of the ways you could use a synchronous generator with a variable speed resource like wind would be to perform what's called full conversion. Or an electrically excited or even a permanent magnet synchronous generator is essentially driven at whatever speed is driving it by the variable speed resource so it produces wild three-phase AC meaning three-phase AC without any regard for proper phase sequence, phase shift, voltage, magnitude, or frequency. The result in wild three-phase AC is then converted entirely DC using a power electronics device known as a rectifier. The DC output of the rectifier is then converted to tame and docile three-phase AC with the correct magnitude, frequency, phase shift, and sequence suitable for export to the grid using another power electronics device known as an inverter. A synchronous generator with full conversion can work for variable speed resources, but as you might guess, it's expensive and complicated, principally because the power electronics device is central to full conversion must be sized to accommodate the full output of the generator, meaning if any little part in this larger system doesn't work, the whole thing doesn't work. I'm not saying synchronous generation with full conversion doesn't work, but I am saying there are some complications. Ask me how I know. For this reason, other generation methods exist that might be better suited for variable speed resources. For example, consider plain old induction or asynchronous generation. It's not the sexiest nor the smartest type of generation, but it is cheap and allows for some variability in speed. Viewers recall an induction machine driven above its natural synchronous speed can act like a generator and exports real electrical power. A wind turbine generator making use of a simple induction style generator could theoretically self-regulate rotational speed inside a given range by catching or spilling excess wind by pitching or turning the blades into or out of the wind thereby keeping generator output inside a desired specification. This does allow for a degree of speed variability, but not much. Also, it needs to be mentioned, induction generators have a dirty habit necessitating the constant consumption of reactive power to create a rotating magnetic field central to the induction process. Viewers will recall a synchronous generator, in contrast, can operate at unity power factor by adjusting field current to under or over excite the rotor. 
we've essentially got two choices, each with desirable benefits and undesirable drawbacks. First, synchronous generators, which do allow for a fine degree of control over reactive power, but need to be driven at a fixed speed. And second, induction generators, which do allow a degree of speed variability, however necessitate the constant consumption of reactive power. Wouldn't it be great to have a third option that allows a degree of speed variability and control reactive power? It's at this point in the show, D-Fig busts through the stadium wall like the Kool-Aid man, climbs to the top ropes and does a backflip into the ring accompanied by the Scorpion song, Rock You Like a Hurricane. D-Fig is the ideal third option, the best of both worlds, one which offers both a degree of speed variability and control of reactive power. For this reason, a significant number of modern horizontal axis wind turbines make use of this style of a generator. Despite the title, doubly fed induction generator, this is actually an extension of synchronous generation. I explain the possible origins for this misnomer in the aforementioned doubly fed induction motor lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, and I'll probably do so again since it infuriates me to no end. Despite the erroneous title, you can't deny the results. Fixed frequency output given variable speed input, and the control of reactive power, the best of both worlds. What makes double fed induction generation different from traditional synchronous generation is that the physical position of the rotor and the electromagnet on the rotor aren't tied together and can be independently varied. If the variable speed prime mover is driving the rotor too slow, the rotor electromagnet is sped up so it keeps the two magnetic fields aligned and output frequency remains constant. If however the variable speed prime mover is driving the rotor too fast, the rotor electromagnet is set to rotating backwards so it keeps the two magnetic fields aligned and output frequency remains constant. That was the point of me telling you the entertaining story of my youth. The resultant rotational speed of two rotating bodies adds up if they're going in the same direction and it's the difference if they're spinning counter to each other. You will never forget this explanation and that was the point. This is how doubly fed induction generation works. Given a variable speed rotor, one can change the rotational speed of the electromagnet on the rotor such that to an outside observer, i.e. the stator, the electromagnet appears to maintain constant rotational speed. Consider a two-pole pair per phase generator that necessitates an electromagnet past the stator windings at 1800 RPM clockwise to maintain a 60 Hz excitation frequency with a proper phase sequence. If the rotor is turning at 1800 RPM clockwise, the electromagnet can just pick a spot on the rotor, sit down and enjoy the ride. This is traditional synchronous generation with constant zero hertz on the rotor. Let's say the variable speed prime mover hits a lull and slows down to 1770 RPM clockwise. To keep excitation frequency at the desired 60 Hz, the electromagnet starts running laps on the rotor at 30 RPMs clockwise. Result is an electromagnet that turns at 1770 plus 30 or the desired 1800 RPM. This is hyposynchronous or subsynchronous operation, a generation below ordinarily synchronous speed, something a traditional synchronous generator is incapable of doing. In hyposynchronous mode to keep the speed of the electromagnet constant, the electromagnet needs to revolve on the rotor in the same direction as the underspeed rotor. Let's say the variable speed prime mover absorbs a sudden gust and speeds up to 1860 RPM clockwise. To keep excitation frequency at the desired 60 Hz, the electromagnet starts running laps on the rotor in the opposite direction at 60 RPM counterclockwise or negative 60 RPM. The result is an electromagnet that turns at 1860 minus 60 or the desired 1800 RPM. This is called super or hypersynchronous operation, a generation above ordinary synchronous speed, again something a traditional synchronous generator is incapable of doing. In hypersynchronous mode, to keep the speed of the electromagnet constant, the electromagnet needs to revolve in the rotor in the opposite direction as the overspeed rotor. Long story short, as a variable speed prime mover drives the rotor at inconsistent speeds, the rotating magnetic field on the rotor is so adjusted such that the electromagnet passes the stator windings at a fixed constant speed, thus the resultant excitation frequency is maintained at that specified desired value. Additionally, while in operation, the field current to the rotor can be adjusted to under or overexcite the rotor, thus changing reactive power requirements. In summary, D-Fig is the best of both worlds, fixed frequency output at variable rotational speed input, and the ability to control reactive power requirements. Allow me to demonstrate. As with a doubly fed induction motor, a doubly fed induction generator is simply a repurposed wound rotor induction motor with a fixed frequency three phase AC on the stator and a power electronics device known as an AC to AC converter on the rotor which creates variable frequency three phase AC. 
As with the stator, three-phase AC on the rotor creates a similarly rotating magnetic field. You'll recall in motor mode, the rotating magnetic field on the rotor locks into the stator rotating magnetic field and follows it around and around and around, exerting torque on the shaft so that it transfers rotating mechanical power to a driven load. By varying the excitation frequency and direction of the rotor rotating magnetic field, the two magnetic fields remain locked in with each other, however the rotor is free to turn at different rotational speeds. Generator mode is essentially a repeat of the same setup with one major difference. In generator mode, some outside mechanical force known as a prime mover grabs the shaft and spins it, forcing the rotor rotating magnetic field past the state of rotating magnetic field as it does so, exporting real electric power to the grid. Consider an idle doubly fed induction machine with two pole pairs per phase intended to operate at 60 Hz in neither motor nor generator mode. Some outside mechanical force spins up the rotor to 1800 RPM clockwise, at which point the stator field is energized by 60 Hz. Given the rotor is turning at 1800 RPM, a synchronous speed for a two pole pair per phase stator, the rotor is then excited with 0 Hz DC. The stationary electromagnet on the rotor locks into the rotating magnetic field in the stator and the device starts to turn synchronously. This is a perfect setup to enter generator mode. In generator mode, some outside mechanical force, in a lab setting I'll be using a drive dynamometer, starts exerting 1.5 newton meters torque in the clockwise direction. Given this device is synchronized with the 60 Hz grid, it can't go faster than the grid, so it remains at that same rotational speed, however starts exporting real electrical power to the grid on the order of 266 watts with a negative sign means it's going away from the generator and into the grid. Fuel current is adjusted such that the generator neither absorbs nor supplies reactive power. In this condition, the generator consumes 1.5 newton meters at 1800 RPM or roughly 283 watts of mechanical power. To power the 0 Hz DC fixed magnetic field, the rotor consumes roughly 50 watts of power. In total, the doubly fed induction generator consumes 283 watts of mechanical power and 50 watts of electrical power comes in and 265 watts goes out for a total export of 216 watts. This amounts to an efficiency of roughly 76.3%. This operating point is essentially equivalent to traditional synchronous generation, a fixed DC on the rotor and the rotor being turned exactly at synchronous speed. If we stepped up or down field current, we could under or over excite the rotor such that it supplies or absorbs reactive power well, let's just keep this in the balanced zero of our state. If we had a constant speed prime mover, we could operate like this all day. Problem is we don't. Sometimes the resource driving the prime mover likes to speed up, slow down, or take the day off entirely. Case in point, let's say there's a lull and rotor speed drops down to 1710 RPM. This is a deal breaker in traditional synchronous generators, which must be kept at a constant speed, but for DFIG, this is well inside its capabilities because the rotor electromagnet and the rotor physical position aren't tied together as with a traditional synchronous generator. Given the rotor drop to 1710 RPM to maintain synchronous operation at sub-synchronous speeds, the rotor electromagnet needs to start rotating at 90 RPM in the same direction, such that the electromagnet appears to move at 1710 plus 90 or the desired 18 at RPM. An algebraic manipulation of the rotational speed formula demonstrates 90 RPM for a two pole pair per phase device amounts to an excitation frequency of 3 Hertz. That means a check in our work. Another application of the rotational speed formula demonstrates 1710 RPM for a two pole pair per phase device amounts to an excitation frequency of 57 Hertz. Makes sense. 3 plus 57 equals 60 Hertz just as 1710 plus 90 equals 1800 RPM. The AC to AC converter steps up rotor excitation frequency from DC to 3 Hz AC and the electromagnets remain synchronized at 1800 RPM. In addition to increasing excitation frequency, I should note the AC to AC converter on the rotor also steps up voltage magnitude in the same proportion, primarily because the inductive impedance of the rotor is a frequency dependent phenomenon. If we fail to increase voltage as we raise the excitation frequency, we would eventually see field current progressively decrease and decrease an eventual under excitation of the rotor. With increased voltage magnitude at increased excitation frequencies, field current remains inside a desired range since the generator neither supplies nor absorbs reactive power. Doubly fed induction motor lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, explored the consequences of this in some detail. This demonstration will continue to make use of a linear volts per hertz profile so field current remains inside an ideal range and reactive power needs remain balanced. In this hyposynchronous condition, the prime mover still exerts 1.5 newton meters at a reduced speed of 1700 RPM. 
So the generator consumes reduced mechanical power input of roughly 270 watts. To power the 3 Hz rotating magnetic field, the rotor consumes an increased amount of roughly 65 watts of electrical power. This operating point still continues to export roughly 264 watts of real electrical power from the stator, where again the negative sign implies real electrical power is leaving the generator and ending the grid. In total, the doubly fed induction generator consumes 270 watts of mechanical power and 65 watts of real electrical power came in and 264 watts came out for a total export of roughly 199 watts. This amounts to an efficiency of roughly 73.7%. Let's say the prime mover slows down yet again, this time to 1620 RPM. To maintain synchronous operation at the subsynchronous speed, the rotor electromagnet needs to start rotating 180 RPM in the same direction such that the electromagnet remains the desired 1800 RPM. An algebraic manipulation of the rotational speed formula demonstrates 180 RPM for a two pole pair per phase device amounts to an increased excitation frequency of 6 Hz. The AC to AC converter steps up excitation frequency to 6 Hz and the electromagnets remain synchronized at 1800 RPM. Importantly, given the inductive impedance of the rotors a frequency dependent phenomenon, Voltage is also increased in the same proportion as excitation frequency, so field current remains inside a desired range since the generator neither absorbs nor supplies reactive power. In this hyposynchronous condition, the prime mover still exerts 1.5 newton meters at a reduced speed of 1620 RPM, so the generator consumes a reduced mechanical power input of roughly 254 watts. To power the 6 Hz rotating magnetic field, the rotor consumes an increased amount of roughly 79 watts of power. At this operating point, the stator continues to export roughly 266 watts of real power, where again the negative sign implies real electrical power is leaving the stator and entering the grid. In total, the doubly fed injection generator consumes 254 watts of mechanical power and 79 watts of real electrical power came in and 264 watts came out for a total export of roughly 188 watts. This amounts to an efficiency of roughly 73%. After a couple rounds of this, you should be getting an idea of what's happening in hyposynchronous mode, i.e. below synchronous speed. If you were to draw a graph of electrical and mechanical properties as a function of rotational speed, it would look something like this. Electrical power exported by the stator remains relatively constant at around 265 watts. Note it's in negative territory which implies it's exporting rather than consuming electrical power. Given constant torque, mechanical power consumed by the generator decreases at reduced rotational speeds. In order to keep the electromagnet synchronized, electrical power consumed by the rotor goes up at reduced rotational speeds. As a result, efficiency at reduced rotational speeds decreases. Long story short, you don't really want to run a doubly fed induction generator in hypersynchronous mode because of decreased efficiency. This being said, you still can run it at less than synchronous speeds. A traditional synchronous generator has one operating point and one operating point only right here at synchronous speed and you cannot run it anywhere else at all. That's the point of defig. Sure, it takes some effort and you operate at reduced efficiency, but you can keep the electromagnet synchronized at less than synchronous speed. But wait, there's more. One can also run a defig in hypersynchronous mode, i.e. at speeds above ordinary synchronous speed. Before we jump into a practical demonstration of hypersynchronous operation, take a look at the almost linear nature of these plots of rotor and stator and mechanical power below ordinarily synchronous speed. Can you draw some conclusions about what's going to happen above synchronous speed? A particular interest is rotor electrical power. If we extend the linear slopes of these plots, the rotor electrical power plot will run straight into the x-axis and deep into negative territory. What in the hell is negative electrical power? Negative electrical power means we're exporting real power. How will this affect efficiency? Place your bets on what you think is in store and we'll see if this is the case. Let's say the prime mover starts going to work big time and speeds up rotational speed to 1920 RPM. To maintain synchronous operation at this hypersynchronous speed, the rotor electromagnet needs to start rotating at 120 RPM backwards or counterclockwise or negative 120 RPM so that the electromagnet remains the desired 1800 RPM. An algebraic manipulation of the rotational speed formula demonstrates 120 RPM for a two pole pair per phase device amounts to an excitation frequency of 4 Hz. Since it needs to go counterclockwise, let's call this negative 4 Hz. The AC to AC converter changes excitation frequency to negative 4 Hz and the rotor and stator electromagnets remain synchronized to 1800 RPM. Importantly, voltage is also proportionally increased so field current remains inside a desired range such that the generator neither supplies nor absorbs reactive power. 
in this hypersynchronous condition, the prime mover still exerts 1.5 newton meters at an increased rotational speed of 1920 RPM, so the generator consumes increased mechanical power input of roughly 302 watts. To power the negative 4 hertz rotating magnetic field, the rotor consumes a decreased amount of roughly 36 watts of power. This operating point still exports roughly 266 watts of real electrical power, where again the negative sign implies real electrical power is leaving the stator and entering the grid. In total, the doubly fed injection generator consumes 302 watts of mechanical power, and 36 watts of real electrical power came into the rotor, and 264 watts came out of the stator for a total export of roughly 228 watts. This amounts to an efficiency of roughly 75.5%. That's just the beginning. The prime mover again ramps up rotational speed, this time to 2,040 RPM. To maintain synchronous operation at this hypersynchronous speed, the rotor electromagnet now needs to rotate at 240 RPM backwards or counterclockwise so that the electromagnets remain synchronized at the desired 1800 RPM. An algebraic manipulation of the rotational speed formula demonstrates 240 RPM for a two-pole pair per phase device amounts to an excitation frequency of 8 Hz. Since it needs to go counterclockwise, let's call this negative 8 Hz. The AC to AC converter changes excitation frequency to negative 8 Hz, and the rotor and stator electromagnets remain synchronized to 1800 RPM. Importantly, voltage is also proportionally increased, so field current remains inside a desired range, so that the generator neither supplies nor absorbs reactive power. In this hypersynchronous condition, the prime mover still exerts 1.5 Newton meters at an increased rotational speed of 2040 RPM, so the generator consumes an increased amount of mechanical power of roughly 320 watts. Powering the negative 8 hertz rotating magnetic field necessitates the rotor consumes a decreased amount of roughly 17 watts of real electrical power. The stator continues to export roughly 268 watts of real electrical power, where again the negative sign implies real electrical power is leaving the generator and entering the grid. In total, the doubly fed induction generator consumes 320 watts of mechanical power, and 17 watts of real electrical power came into the rotor, and 260 watts came out of the stator for a total export of roughly 250 watts. This amounts to an efficiency of roughly 78.4%. If we revisit our earlier graphs of electrical and mechanical properties of functional rotational speed extended in a hypersynchronous mode, you shouldn't be surprised. Electrical power exported by the stator remains relatively constant. After all, the stator is blissfully unaware that anything has changed, and it still sees an electromagnet pass it at regular 1800 RPM despite elevated rotor speed. Given constant torque, Mechanical power consumed by the generator increases at increased rotational speeds. Electrical power consumed by the rotor continues to go down at increased rotational speeds. We're not in negative territory yet, but it does seem like the job of keeping the two electromagnets aligned does get easier and easier at increased rotational speeds. As a result, efficiency increases at increased rotational speeds. Long story short, this is where you want to run a doubly fed induction generator. Not only is the hypersynchronous range unavailable to traditional synchronous generators, which have one operating point and one operating point only, it's also more efficient than traditional operation. This is like a double bonus round. But wait, that's not all. If the prime mover is capable of exerting enough mechanical power to further accelerate the rotor, one of two things is going to happen. One, nothing. Yeah, kind of a buzzkill, but sometimes nothing cool happens. Or two, something super cool happens. The electrical power consumed in the rotor will eventually go negative, and we can start extracting power from both the rotor and the stator. This is where we enter the triple secret bonus round. Allow me to differentiate between these two paths. Without taking the AC to AC converter entirely apart and taking those parts into a smaller and smaller and smaller parts, which might necessitate a 22 week long discussion of semiconductor devices and circuits power electronics, one can simplify the AC to AC converter as an AC to DC converter, a rectifier, hooked back to back with a DC to AC converter, an inverter. Up to this point, we've been using the AC to AC converter in one direction only, where it accepts incoming three phase AC with a fixed voltage magnitude and frequency from the source rectifies it all to DC, then inverts this DC to three-phase AC with user-adjustable magnitude and frequency and then sends it to the rotor. If we use a traditional unidirectional AC to AC converter intended for one-way operation source to rotor only, this essentially kills the possibility of exporting power from the rotor to the source because it's not designed to operate backwards. If, however, you do have a bi-directional AC to AC converter or are very comfortable infringing upon General Electric's numerous patents for bi-directional AC to AC converters, the moment the rotor power goes negative, the AC to AC converter rectifies it, inverts it, and sends it back to the source. 
compare and contrast a doubly fed induction generator with a bi-directional AC to AC converter on the rotor only with our earlier diagram of a traditional electrically excited or even a permanent magnet synchronous generator with full conversion. For obvious reasons, doubly fed induction generator with a bi-directional AC to AC converter on the rotor is sometimes referred to as partial conversion. While both systems do allow for electrical power generation at different rotational speeds, DFIG with partial conversion is substantially cheaper than synchronous generation with full conversion because those power electronics on the rotor don't need to be sized to handle all the power transfer all the time. Assuming we have this bidirectional capacity, we might extend the plots of electrical and mechanical properties of function rotational speed as follows. As rotational speed continues to decrease, electrical power exported by the stator should remain relatively constant. Given constant torque, mechanical power consumed by the generator continues to increase at increased rotational speeds. Of interest, electrical power consumed by the rotor eventually crosses zero and goes negative, implying the rotor also exports real power. Total power exported by the doubly fed induction generator is additive, given the rotor and stator have the same polarity. Here's a couple of sample data points where I've extrapolated the rotor data as if I was using a bidirectional AC to AC converter. At 2160 RPM, the AC to AC converter supplies negative 12 Hertz to the rotor such that it revolves at 360 RPM counterclockwise and the electromagnets remain synchronized to 1800 RPM. Mechanical power input increases to roughly 339 Watts. The standard continues to export roughly 269 Watts, only this time the rotor also exports 5 Watts. 339 Watts of mechanical power went in, and 269 plus 5, or 274 watts of real electrical power came out. This yields an efficiency of roughly 80.8%. At 2,280 RPM, the AC to AC converter supplies negative 16 hertz to the rotor, such that it revolves at 480 RPM counterclockwise, and the electromagnets remain synchronized to 1800 RPM. Mechanical power input increases to roughly 358 watts. The stator continues to export roughly 266 watts, and the rotor exports an increased amount of 24 watts. 358 watts of mechanical power went in, and 266 plus 24, or 290 watts, went out. It yields an increased efficiency of roughly 81%. Long story short, given we're exporting power from both the rotor and the stator at higher and higher hypersynchronous speeds, efficiency continues to increase. This is where you want to run a doubly fed induction generator. Not only is it expanding the range of traditional synchronous generation above synchronous speed, it's also more efficient. Now, before you get too excited, realize you can't expect efficiency to keep climbing forever and this does have its limits. Last, I wanted to share with you a quick visual that may assist you if the graphs aren't doing these tricks. One of the lab manuals I use has the students draw arrows illustrating power flow for synchronous, hyposynchronous, and hypersynchronous operation. It might seem hokey, but I found this actually helps certain students really visualize what's happening. In a synchronous condition, a certain amount of mechanical power is consumed by the generator. Establishing the fixed these field on the rotor necessitates the consumption of a certain amount of real electrical power. In this synchronous state, the stator exports an amount of real power. As a result, the total quantity of real electrical power is exported for use. In hyposynchronous conditions, the rotor still exerts the same torque but at a reduced rotational speed. As a result, mechanical power input decreases. Establishing a rotating magnetic field on the rotor to make up the difference necessitates the consumption of more real electrical power. In this hyposynchronous state, the stator exports roughly the same amount of real electrical power. As a result, a reduced total quantity of real electrical power is exported for use. In hypersynchronous conditions, the rotor is still exerting the same torque, but at an increased rotational speed. As a result, mechanical power input increases. Establishing a rotating magnetic field in the rotor necessitates consumption of less real electrical power. In this hypersynchronous state, the stator exports roughly the same amount of real power. As a result, an increased total quantity of real electrical power is exported for use. Above a certain hypersynchronous speed and with the bidirectional AC to AC converter, mechanical power continues to decrease and the rotor eventually starts exporting real power. As a result, an increased total quantity of real electrical power is exported for use. Lastly, lastly, despite the simplified explanation of DFIG featured in this lecture, don't for a moment think DFIG is easy. Think about all the incoming data the control system needs to simultaneously keep track of and manage to ensure the generation process works at all, let alone efficiently. Obviously, a control system needs to keep track of rotational speed and quickly respond to any variances by increasing or decreasing rotor excitation frequency to keep the two electromagnets synchronized. As if this wasn't challenging enough, changes in excitation frequency also necessitate simultaneous changes in voltage because of changing inductive impedance so field current remains inside a desired range 
such that instantaneous reactive power requirements can be met. Add to these electrical complexities the management of mechanical actuators that control blade pitch used to regulate mechanical power input. Add to the electrical and mechanical complexities manufacturer-specific management schemes like vector control, direct torque control, and low-voltage ride-through. For these recognizable reasons, DFIG is sometimes referred to as DFIGPFM, doubly fed induction generation pure fine magic. This being said, despite the complexities of real-time management, DFIG ultimately is synchronous generation, only it occurs at variable speeds, principally because the rotor's physical position and the electromagnet are not tied together. In hyposynchronous operation, the rotor electromagnet can be turned in the same direction as the underspeed rotor to make up the difference. Whereas in hypersynchronous operation, the rotor electromagnet can be turned in the opposite direction of the overspeed rotor to slow it down. In either scenario, the stator is none the wiser and continues operating as if an electromagnet maintains synchronous speed. The sheer cunningness of this trickery never ceases to amaze and impress me. In conclusion, we compared and contrasted the benefits and drawbacks of traditional synchronous generators with induction generators and discussed how DFIG is an ideal third option which can both operate at variable rotational speeds and manage reactive power requirements. We learned in hyposynchronous operation, the rotor electromagnet can be turned in the same direction as the underspeed rotor to make up the difference. And in hypersynchronous operation, the rotor electromagnet can be turned in the opposite direction of the overspeed rotor to slow it down. Additionally, we examine plots of DFIG electrical and mechanical properties at different rotational speeds and explore these of a bidirectional AC to AC converter to extract power from the rotor. Lastly, we compared and contrasted synchronous generators making use of full converters with DFIGs making use of comparatively less expensive partial converters. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.